Today I'm going to talk about why I'm not an inerratist. And as I've said in a previous video, this is not because I want to be a missionary for being an errantist. Uh, at most, I would want to show that the type of position that I hold is possible. I think that could be helpful to some people, but it's not that I'm trying to convert you to it. But I do think that people are interested in this, and I think it can also uh, show that it's not necessary to go some other routes, certainly not necessarily to lose your faith, and also certainly not necessary to go the route of uh, the literary devices, which I've talked about in other videos. In the last video, I talked a little bit about the different kinds of traditional inerrancy, and then somewhat of my own history passing through those kinds. And as I said, I spent some years in the position of being a non-deductive inerrantist, and I was using both theological considerations and uh, inductive considerations of just the, the, the Bible seemed to uh, be true so often when I could check it out on like historical matters it had a good track record and so many of the alleged contradictions turned out not to be a problem at all and so with that in mind I just kind of hung out in that spot for a while but I, I began to be uneasy about some things so one of the things I began to be uneasy about this would be maybe seven years ago, eight years ago, something like that, was what I called the disjunction in my last video. And I talked about the fact that to be an errantist, all that you have to believe is that either this or this or this or this is an error. You don't have to have a specific commitment on just one of them. And I found myself saying things like, well, I don't know of anything definite that is an error. And so then when I would be asked or when I would think about the question, am I an inerratist, I would say yes, on the grounds that I didn't have anything that I was willing to commit to that was definitely an error. But as I thought about it, I realized that it doesn't necessarily follow. You know, even if I don't have any one thing that I'm willing to commit to that is definitely an error, the question is, do I believe it's true or false that one or the other of these things is an error? Um, and that's a, that's a very different kind of thing. And I realized that maybe in some sense I was avoiding making that investigation so that I could just go on saying, yeah, I don't know of anything in specific, so I'm an inerrantist. And, and that, that's not really uh, wholly intellectually honest, at least when I'm talking to people for whom it's important. And part of the reason I wasn't making that investigation was that it wasn't that big of a deal to me. My uh, faith was not founded on inerrant, inerrancy. Uh, but if you're talking to people to whom it is a big deal, it's it's better to have a sort of a more robust thing uh, rather than to be out there saying, can I find some way to say that I'm an inerrantist? It's more important to just give a straightforward answer. So that was one thing I became uneasy about. Then I became uneasy about the uh, Canaanite and Amalekite slaughters in the Old Testament. I want to try to not spend a lot of time on that in this video. I'll link something uh, below, but I have worked for so many years with the pro-life movement and you know that's really part of a overall worldview and I had spent decades arguing against the sort of uh, instances where they, people would try to say well what about this isn't it okay to kill a baby in this case deliberately and I'd say no and uh, argue that, that it's an absolute prohibition and so and that's part of this overall way of looking at things that man is made in the image of god and the old testament itself also teaches this that uh, god hates the the shedding of innocent blood so i began to see a real tension there both with other scriptures and with the natural law that i had uh, put a lot of time into developing a very uh coherent well-argued pro-life worldview that this is always wrong and um I do make a big distinction between God sending uh, out his power and, and taking uh, infants to himself, which he can do having, among other things, their best interests in mind, and God's ordering a, a person, you know, or a group of people, hey, go out there and cut off the heads of those infants. I, I think that there's a big difference between those two. So I don't want to go on and on. Um, I, I also did not think that the... Uh, the Copan and Flanagan answer was a full answer. In fact, they themselves <clears throat> do not really bill it as a full answer in the sense that um, God didn't, uh, on their view, order any infants to be slaughtered. That's not even their claim. It's that God didn't order genocide. Well, the word genocide isn't what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about 
you know, even if they're only five uh, infants, that, you know, it's going to be out there, go out there and cut their throats, then that's, that's an issue. Um, so I was very uneasy about that and, and felt that, um, you know, that was troubling and a, a potential place of an error uh, in, in the Bible. I want to emphasize here, though, that that was not a conclusion I came to lightly. And I do not accept the statement that, well, if you think that, then if you think God wouldn't command against homosexual practice either, so throw this out, throw that out, that is, that is a, a, a caricature of that approach. I think we need to have a, a better, more robust concept of the natural law and a natural law insight, like that it's always wrong to pitchfork babies, is not just a preference or a feeling or something that you come to lightly. So I do not acknowledge that uh, having that kind of concern and considering that there uh, plausibly may be an error in those texts is the same thing as just throwing out any part of the Bible that you don't like or that you just it just doesn't fit with your sensibilities or something like that. And so I do think we need to get a, a better idea of a robustly grounded natural law reasoning. Okay, so those were a couple of things that began making me uneasy. And then I started digging into the Gospels in much more detail. Um, because, of course, obviously there are dozens of claimed contradictions, and I found that the majority of them were junk. Um, the majority of them were easily harmonizable. They were no problem. They just showed a, a lack of historical imagination, or they were strained to create a contradiction, or uh, they just, they were no problem. Um, but amongst them, there were a handful in the Gospels, which is what I was studying most intensively, uh, where it, I thought it was plausible that it could be a good faith error. And I recognized, too, that what was happening was that the literary device theorists that I was studying at this point were, like, ignoring the good faith error option. I, I, strangely, they ignore it for Plutarch as well, and nobody thinks Plutarch is inerrant. I don't know what this is. It's, like, too boring or something to say. Maybe Plutarch just made a mistake. Um, but I could definitely see that with the Gospels, uh, a motive might be that a conservative audience isn't going to take too kindly to that. And so even if the theorists themselves are not motivated that way, and then they will build themselves, you know, oh, I am just a historian. I am just following the evidence. Well, okay, if you're not driven by theological considerations, then why not consider the possibility of good faith error? But many in the audience who were uh, sort of jumping on the bandwagon with these literary device views without really thinking them through, I think were doing it because they felt uncomfortable uh, with claiming a good faith error. And then it's almost like a pun, you know? The information is false, but it's not an error. He did it on purpose. Ha, ha, ha. Um, you know, normally that's not what's meant by not an error in inerrancy. And I've got a whole other video about that that I'm not going to rehearse right now. But I realized that that, for whatever reason, that option of good faith error was just being neglected again and again, both in the secular literature and in the Gospels. And that for purely historical reasons, it needed to be given consideration if we're just trying to investigate these historically. Now, um, there's kind of a question, um, what would be some examples? So I'm going to give a few examples here. This is not a comprehensive list. I'll be repeating that later. Uh, I've already given the Centurion example in my pesky Centurion video, which see. Um, Another example would be the, the order of events in the cursing of the fig tree between Matthew and Mark. It seems to me plausible that Matthew is, in a sense, trying to correct Mark. Mark uh, definitely does not uh, put it in the same order that Matthew does. Matthew has the cleansing of the temple before the cursing of the fig tree. Now, and, and Mark has it after, in between the cursing and the withering. Now, the usual uh, traditional harmonization there is what's called a chronological narration, what I've dubbed that. And that's a, an author just not saying the order, and that's usually applied to Matthew. The idea being that Matthew is not trying to give the impression that these things happened in that order. I find that somewhat strained when I read that passage of Matthew. I would maybe go this far, would be to say maybe... Matthew's only semi-correcting Mark. He's not being as explicit as he could be because he's not certain of his memory, but he has a feeling that Mark is wrong. Um, but but Mark may actually be right. Certainly, uh, it it 
is a very live theory, to my mind, very plausible that Matthew and Mark contradict one another on that order, in which case, if they really do contradict one another, one of them must be wrong. Um, so that would be an example. Um, another example would be on what day in Holy Week were Jesus' feet and head anointed by Mary of Bethany. It seems to me that John is pretty definite in putting that on the Saturday, right before the triumphal entry, and Mark is pretty definite putting it on the Wednesday of Holy Week. Again, a, um, a chronological theory is probably your best traditional harmonization there, in this case applied to Mark. Um, but I, as I've discussed a little bit in The Mirror of the Mask, that just doesn't seem uh, to me to be a, a natural reading of Mark at all. And it, it just looks to me like Mark is trying to be chronological at that point. I think he really wants to imply a chronology at that point, in which case there, there is a contradiction. Um, there are also some where, whether you call it a contradiction or not, can get a little hair splitting. So, for example, I've suggested that Luke did not know about the journey to Egypt. Maybe Mary just decided for whatever reason not to tell Luke about that. Um, and so when, when Luke says in Luke 2 that after they'd accomplished all the things required by the law, they returned to Nazareth, he does not say explicitly that they returned immediately. But if he didn't know about the trip to Egypt, then that would seem to be what he is intending to imply. So if you try to say that's not an error, even though that's what he's implying, but you kind of lean on the fact that it's not explicit, that seems to me to be a little hair splitting. If the author is intending to imply something, maybe just because he doesn't know about something, then you might as well call it an error. Um, and, you know, one of the things about not being an inerrantist is that you don't have to lean quite so strongly on that distinction. Now, those are just examples. I'm going to say this again. It is not a comprehensive list. It was odd uh, last year when Dr. Lacona was doing a series of videos critiquing me, and then he had some things that he wrote at that same time. He literally said at one point something to the effect, that, well, Lydia didn't list this about the chronology of the cursing of the fig tree, and I would assume that she would have listed this in the Mirror of the Mask if she thought this was a plausible error. I have no idea why he would assume that. I never said anywhere in the Mirror of the Mask, nor did I ever imply that I was giving a comprehensive list. I have a footnote. Well, you're obviously not going to put a comprehensive list in a content footnote. I meant to give examples, okay, relevant examples that are relevantly similar to the others, representative examples, but obviously you're not going to give a complete list in a footnote. And the only other time that I bring up the cursing of the fig tree is where I'm discussing the achronological, dischronological distinction. I'm not actually trying to discuss what I think about the cursing of the fig tree. That's an important distinction. So he said something like, well, she discusses it. Well, not in that sense of discuss. Um, I'm just il illustrating the way that this achronological dischronological distinction is uh, not observed. It is confused by scholars. I believe I was discussing Craig Keener in that context. So uh, yeah, I think the cursing of the fig tree is a plausible candidate where either Mark or Matthew may have made an error. You know, maybe Matthew is being a little bit uh, inexplicit if he's not quite sure of his memories, but it kind of looks to me like he's intending to correct Mark. Uh, another reason that this list is not comprehensive is that I can change my mind back the other way too. So, you know, I'm not going to set some list in stone because I could decide that something isn't an error anymore. If new information comes to my mind or if I uh, am given a new view of it or a new harmonization that I hadn't thought of before. An example here concerns when Jesus dismissed the crowd right after the feeding of the 5,000. On the face of it, it looks like there's a contradiction between Mark and John, where Mark says that uh, he immediately sent the disciples away in the boat and he dismissed the crowd. And, you know, I always kind of pictured Jesus going down to the seashore and dismissing them in the boat, and then it's only after they leave that he dismisses the crowd. And if, if that were the case, then you would have an apparent contradiction with John, who has Jesus uh, leaving and going up the mountain to pray to escape the crowd because they're going to uh, try to make him king by force. And then it says, and when it was evening, the disciples came down to the boat. And so it makes it sound like Jesus had already done whatever he was going to do and went up to the mountain before they came down to the boat. But it was uh, later explained to me by a helpful inerrantist. Um, he was talking about this, that Jesus didn't have to be 
sending the disciples away right at the shore. He could be up, you know, near to the mountainside where he'd been meeting with the people and say, you guys can go, you know, get out of here. And then it takes them a while to go down to the shore. And so the things are kind of happening at the same time. And, and while they're going down, Jesus is dismissing the crowd and going up to the mountains to pray. There's a big crowd. They have th- finding it hard to get down, you know. And so at that point, John and Mark are just giving different perspectives. But, you know, he immediately dismissed the disciples in a boat to go over to the other side. And then he dismissed and And he dismissed the crowd. Doesn't have to mean. And then after the disciples had left, he dismissed the crowd. He doesn't have to be standing there going, bye-bye to the disciples, you know, before he dismisses the crowd. I thought about that, and I thought that was a good one. So now I think that that is harmonizable with that amount of reasonable uh, historical imagination. I was explaining that one time on a show. I think it might have been Jonathan McClatchy's show, and a skeptic in the audience was speaking up and saying, that sounds like desperation. Lydia said she thought about that and thought about that. Well, see, she was desperate to have a, an answer. Well, obviously, it's not desperation because I'm not an inerrantist. It was just curiosity, historical curiosity. And I could change my mind in both directions. I can say, you know, I, I didn't think this was an error, and then I thought about it more, and I think it probably was, and I, I thought this probably was an error, and then I thought about it more, and I kind of mulled over it because I'm interested in these things, and I changed my mind, and I think it's probably not an error. Um, you just don't. You don't understand me if you think that's desperation. Um, So that's another reason for not claiming that I'm giving a comprehensive list, that I can change my mind the other way too. Um, I want to say something here that I think is a little unusual. The theological considerations were part of what withheld me. You know, I was that type of inheritance that combines theological and uh, track record considerations for quite some time because I would agree that if you consider something <clears throat> inspired by God and it's given by God in a special sense, no, it's not word for word dictated, but still it's supposed to be authoritative. Uh, you should be reluctant to attribute errors to it. That's even historical errors. That's a, uh, you know, it's an argument. It's a consideration. And to the deductive inerrantist, it's like, that's it, man. There just can't be. But I now think of this as being an instance of the problem of evil. Now, in the problem of evil, we have things where we would say, we would think about this and we would say, God would not allow this. You know, God would not allow children to be trafficked. God would not allow these atrocities. God would not allow um, someone to bamboozle innocent people for years and years. God would not allow terrible pain to happen to someone Uh, who's just trying to serve him, and so on and so on. All these problem of evil things. We say, here's my idea of God. I don't think God would allow that. And yet we don't say, so those atrocities must not have happened. I'm just going to be in denial. I'm just going to say that was a, you know, that was an illusion or something. You know, all the evidence for the Holocaust. Well, I'm going to say, oh, it didn't happen because God wouldn't allow that. that. That would not be reasonable. When you have enough evidence that God has allowed something, then Fortunately, you have enough other evidence that God really exists and that he is good, but you have to modify your views and you have to say, okay, it looks like, but it looks like he did allow it. And I think um, in the case of errors in the Bible, that could be a similar thing. Now, I think we shouldn't be in a hurry. That's why, like I said, I'm not going to be out there just going, oh, I don't like this part, meh, oh, I don't like this part, meh, you know, and particularly when it comes to theological views, uh, it's, it's a lot harder to, uh, in a sense, contradict because, um, you know, it's an abstract system. It's not like you're just going to have this empirical proposition. Well, you know, the fig tree is cursed here in this book and it's cursed here in this book and we got a contradiction. Uh, it's going to be a lot less cut and dried to try to say Paul must have been wrong about whether women could be pastors, you know. And, and you know, that may not it with my sensibilities, but I certainly don't have enough evidence to say Paul, an apostle commissioned by Jesus Christ, was wrong about this. So I'm a I'm a complementarian. Um, so this is why I think we should be careful and not be in a hurry. And yet, when we have a lot of evidence, you know, really strong evidence that it looks like there is an error, then just as when we have evidence that God seems to have allowed some horrible evil in the world, we have to say, well, it looks like God did allow that. 
So I think that could be sort of a fruitful way of thinking about it uh, if you're previously a deductive inerrantist. Now, um, why am I doing these videos? Well, as I've said many times, it's because people are interested. It's also because I don't want to be concealing anything. My bringing up the thing about the Canaanite slaughters and the Old Testament slaughters, you know, that's, that's sort of my most shocking one. I don't want to be one of these people who's out there. I'm going to tell you this little trivial one that you shouldn't worry about. And then I'm like hiding this thing that you're going to be more upset about. And then I'll come out with it later and you'll be like, oh, you know, I didn't want to endorse her. What am I doing? You know, I don't want to be that kind of person. So I've, I've told you my most shocking, what I think is probably my most shocking one, um, where I, I think there's probably an error. Um, so I'm also not sure what's going on in Romans 9 because I'm not a Calvinist, so, but we won't get into that right now. Anyway, so I'm trying to be very honest, but I think an, another reason, perhaps the most useful thing about this series is that um, it shows the possibility of a very conservative position. Here I am, I'm saying I'm a complementarian. I think that, and I'm saying, you know, I think that God has uh, commanded that you know, one man and one woman is his plan for marriage. I'm very morally conservative. Um, I'm going to cite scripture for doctrine. And I'm also going to harmonize all over the place. You know, uh, I just haven't had time and have not committed myself to going through the Old Testament one alleged, you know, historical contradictions. I've found uh, plenty of them where they're easily harmonized. And I suspect it's going to be similar to the the New Testament, like, you know, 95%, oh, come on, garbage criticism. And then, you know, a handful where you're like, oh, that could be an error, you know. Um, but I haven't actually verified that prediction. But here I am. I'm harmonizing, harmonizing, harmonizing. I don't think John moved the temple cleansing. I don't adapt those higher critical views. I don't adapt the literary device views. I argue against them. And yet I'm not an inerrantist. And I'm not doing all of those things because I'm an inerrantist. And so just showing these options, I think, can be useful to people who are struggling with doubts about their faith to show the possibility of maybe another option that's unusual that you haven't thought about before. So I hope you find this useful. I do not know what my next video is going to be about, but come back next time and be sure to like and subscribe and recommend this channel to others, the Lydia McGrew YouTube channel where we're making common sense rigorous.